All right. So you may remember if you were here last week that we started a brand new series this week. Uh, Well, last week. We started a brand new series over the walk of a believer. We're going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And each of these books is about, well, what does it mean to walk as a believer? What does it look like in our daily lives? And so since we're going verse by verse, we're going to be taking a long time. So we split it up into smaller series. And this one is let's get real because that's where John starts. He gets real with the real gospel about the real risen Christ and what that means for us. John told us last week about the reason he could speak. And it was simply because he was witness to what God was doing. He was witness to the risen Christ. He walked with Christ and he got to see these things firsthand. And so we can rely on his testimony if we can trust anyone. But John's purpose in writing wasn't what you might call sterilized. John's purpose in writing was not just, well, you know, here's what I know, but you know, do what you want with it. He, he was purposeful in writing. He wanted to put the risen Christ before his hearers and leave the decision up to them. He wanted to encourage them to promote fellowship of the believers, but also joy among the believers because of this risen Christ. It was an exciting thing. It had changed his entire life from that point forward, just as it had all of the other disciples of Jesus. And so as we go through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we're going to see John dealing with these matters of the walk of the Christian, the walk of the follower of Jesus. What does it look like when you are walking with Christ? What does it show about you? What are you made of? And what can we see in your walk? See, your faith, your walk with Christ isn't blind or ignorant, as some people would say of followers of Jesus, or at least it doesn't have to be blind or ignorant. See, our walk isn't just lip service. It's not meaningless. Our walk describes what happens when our feet hit the floor. People aren't going to be changed by the words you say if they see your feet hitting the floor in a way that is contrary to what you profess. To believe. And so today we're going to be in 1 John again, chapter 1, going from verses 5 through 7. I'll be reading out of the NIV. So if you have another translation, different words, but same concept. Okay, starting in verse 5. You can follow along behind me if you'd like. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Will you pray with me? God, we pray this morning as we meet with the risen Christ that not a person here would leave this place untransformed by Christ, that we would all leave this place purified by Christ, no longer slaves to our sin, but slaves to the one true God in whom we have life. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, John begins, again, declaring what he received. This message that he received was from Christ himself. It was a message about God and a message about us. 
Now, I'll tell you, this is one of those messages that if we weren't going verse by verse, I'd just kind of skip over because some of it is awesome. We get to talk about the glory and the greatness of God. That's great. But there's another part of this passage that shines an uncomfortable light on me. And so I've been beat up this week. Uh, and so I plan on passing along that beating to you. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> But we'll start with the good part, okay? Point one, what is God? What is God made of? John tells us that God is light. And so we see in this, this short statement, that God is light. We see characteristics of God because we know about light, do we not? Okay, so what does light mean as far as the word of God has it? Well, God is glorious. Think of a piercing light. If you've ever been in complete darkness or as close to darkness as you could come up with and someone shines one of those halogen light bulbs psh, directly to you, ah, you have to shut your eyes. It may even make you fall back because you're like, ah, I was not expecting that. That is bright. It is a piercing light. Think about when people came face to face with just an angel of God, one that stands in the presence of God. They were driven to fear, many times falling on their knees or falling flat on their face because they came into contact with something that is in the presence of God. And it was awesome, piercing light, the glory of God. Psalm 19.1 tells us that surely the heavens declare the glory of God. The open skies proclaim the work of his hands. The glory of God is awesome. But there's another aspect of light. Being told that God is light, that means that God is self-revealing. God is not secretive. He's not furtive. He's not saying, come to me. And then when people start coming to him, oh, he hides. Are they going to find me? He's not furtive. That's a good, uh, you know, $5 Scrabble word that y'all can look up later. I didn't really know what the word meant before I came across it in a commentary, but I love it. God is not secretive. It says in uh, 2 Chronicles 15, 2b, that God will allow you to find him. If you seek him, he will let you find him. God isn't hiding himself from anyone. But there's another aspect of light. Have you ever thought about your clothes? I see a bunch of you out there wearing white. You think about your shirt, you're like, wow, this is white, this is clear. Have you ever thought about that, like when it snows and you see your white shirt up next to the pure fallen snow and you're like, wow, I thought my shirt was white. It's not really. Man, this is white. Well, the white purity and holiness of God is even more pure because God is more holy than anything we could ever think of or imagine. Without stain, without blotch. Revelation 15, 4 says that you alone are holy. Not you, sorry. God, you alone are holy. So holy that one holy isn't good enough. Let's go ahead and tack on two more to make it clear, just in case you don't see the holiness of God. Holy, 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 God is light. But light also has a function, and this is the thing that's a lot easier for us to understand. Light guides and light reveals. Reveals. See, uh, the Bible tells us that your word is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. It helps us to see where we're going. See, if God is light, then he guides us 
in the way we should go. But light also reveals. Light, when it shines in the darkness, pushes that darkness back. Isaiah 58, 11, Luke 8, 17. We see these messages that there's nothing that's hidden that will not be revealed when the light comes and shows itself to be light. God is light. And it's awesome to, to see this great God. So now we move on to the beating. Uh, you ready? Ready to get beat? What are we made of? Are we light meat or are we dark meat? I was going to tell a story that I think I've already told before about sometime after Thanksgiving when uh, I, I thought I was eating ham, but I was actually eating turkey. I think it was turkey, turkey or chicken or something like that. But I thought it was ham, and I was like, wow, this is the best ham I've ever had. But when it was revealed to me, the darkness of my thoughts, when light was shown on me that, oh, I was not in fact eating ham, I was eating turkey. Not just turkey, but I was eating the turkey loaf. You know what I'm talking about? It's got the, the white and the dark meat, the light and the dark, and you eat it and you're like, great. And I even looked at that and I saw that and I was like, wow, this is interesting ham that I've never <laughs> seen before. See, we can often be wrong, <laughs> but when the light of truth shines on us, we see ourselves, we see the truth for what it is. So, where dark and light meet, what wins? Hello, hello. What wins? The light, the light wins. We know this, right? This is scientific. It's clear to see. I had the idea that I would love to, like, at this point in time, just boosh, turn off all the lights and then have, like, a little flashlight. See, when I turn on the light, it pushes the darkness back. We know this. We see this. Light pushes back darkness, always. It's never the other way around. As a matter of fact, this is one of the things that we see in horror movies. Now, I never got into horror movies, but it's interesting how younger people tend to love them. They want to, yeah, let's go see these horror movies. And what is something that is so common in a horror movie? You see this, not just darkness, but an embodied darkness. And the darkness actually overcomes the lights. It'll turn lights off. Sometimes it'll break bulbs. Sometimes it will just come around and it will cover a light so that the light is not seen. Well, why is that so terrifying to us? Because it doesn't happen, right? It's not real. That's not what happens. God has shared with us the reality that it's not observable that darkness overcomes light because we know the truth that light always overcomes darkness. Light always beats back the darkness. It's scary because it's unnatural. See, the weakest light that shines forth in darker darkness, shines like a beacon. It defeats the darkness. That's because darkness isn't really a thing. Darkness isn't a thing at all. Darkness is actually the lack of the thing called light. That's how we know what darkness is. And the truth that scripture tells us is that where the light of Christ dawns, well, the darkness gets pushed back. Where the light of Christ dawns, 
There is spirit fruit growth that happens. Scripture tells us to examine the fruit of our lives. So when we look at our lives, is the light of Christ pushing back the darkness in our own lives? H.G. Wells says, a man may be a very bad musician and may yet be passionately in love with music. There's truth here for the Christian walk because sometimes we can look at our lives. I know I do this. I look at my life and more often than not, I wonder, man, God, are you in me now? Are you at all? Because I'm not seeing the fruit. I'm not seeing the evidence of your presence. But remember, even the smallest light pushes back the darkness. And as we said earlier, it's not about having a huge bowl of fruit. It's about having fruit. Is there production of the Spirit in this? Galatians 5 tells us that there is fruit of the Spirit. Philippians 1.11 says that there is fruit of righteousness. Are these things in our lives? See, there, there are two different kinds of people in this world. And the same could be said of Christianity. So I'm talking about people in general, but I'm also talking about Christians. On the one hand, there are people who try their hardest, but they fail. These are the people that may say, as Christians, man, it seems like the closer I get to God, the more aware I become of my own sin, the more aware I become of my own sinfulness. Why is that? Well, that's because you're getting closer to the light, and the light is revealing everything in you, all that is in darkness right now. And it's not revealed to us to make us feel bad about ourselves. It's revealed so that it can be dispelled, so that the light can push it back and get rid of it. So the first, pers uh, the first person, the first type of person, tries their hardest, but they fail. And the second person fails to try because they are hardened to God. They are hardened to the truth. And I know there are times in my life when I have been there, even as a Christian, I am hardened to what the Spirit of God reveals in my life. I have revealed issues, things that need to be taken care of, and I haven't dealt with them. And it hurts sometimes. And so what we see here in our passage in John, I want to read again because it's powerful. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. We are liars if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness then we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, well, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all unrighteousness. And so as we're here this morning, it makes me wonder about myself. Is my, light, is my life characterized by light or by darkness because it seems like John is saying that if your life is more characterized by darkness than by light then it's possible that you're in the early stages of Christianity but it's also possible that God has not in fact invaded your life it could be that 
you have not surrendered. You are not repentant for your sin. You don't see yourself, your own blackness in light of the God who is light. You follow? 2 Timothy 3.5 tells us that there are people who have a form of godliness, maybe a behavior, maybe an attitude of godliness, but they deny its power. See, the power of the holy God who is light, the power of the one true God that pushes back the light is to push back or sorry, I said push back the light, (laughs) that pushes back the darkness, is that he will push back the darkness in our lives as well. And it is a process. It does go on for the rest of our lives. It's never over, but there should be evidence of that. William Barclay says, Anyone who claims to love Christ and deliberately disobeys him is guilty of a lie. What is the lie? The lie is that we claim to love Christ. Imagine in our own lives. Imagine you come home from work or you just, you see your spouse for the first time and you walk in and you say, hi. And she's like, hi. Or he's like, Hi, and you sit down on the couch, and you get out of your briefcase or out of your your book bag, you pull out this book, and on the top of the book, it says, guidelines for relationships with your spouse, and so you open it, you're like, okay, ah, here it is, okay, After coming home and seeing them for the first time, give them a kiss and a hug. Okay, all right. Hello, baby. (laughs) Is that love? If we saw that, like on a video, wouldn't it make us laugh? (laughs) Well, why? The same way with the darkness thing. It's, it's unnatural. If you have to look at a book, okay, that, okay, so I'm gonna, gonna oh, hug my wife and, uh, and give her a kiss. And then, uh, okay, I got two kids, got two kids. Um, play with them. Oh, that's amazing. I, I, I think I see where they're going here with this. If we have to look at a book to figure it out, well, then maybe it's because it isn't in us. Maybe it's not really love. And it's the same way with God. We're liars if we claim to love Christ, and yet we don't care the first thing about growing in our relationship with Christ. Now, if we move on to the next slide, we'll see that another aspect of this spirit-led growth in Christ is that the blood of Christ cleanses. We see that in our passage today, 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Christ cleanses. But in Hebrews 9, 22, we hear it said that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Because sin brings death. We learn this from Genesis 2. Sin entered the world, and so by it, death entered the world. Because of sin, there must be death. And that's why Christ died. And so the blood of Christ cleanses those who trust in that blood, who trust in that sacrifice, who trust in that death of the one true God, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. But it doesn't just cleanse us from past sin. 
The blood of Christ prepares us for holy living. It prepares us for a life of righteousness to come. 1 Corinthians 1.30 tells us that Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our holiness. And so this is the thing that gives me hope when I look at my life and I see my own weaknesses, I see my own failings. I can look at the promises of Scripture and I can know that, you know, this isn't about earning my salvation. It's not about earning God's love for me. It's not about showing off for God so that he will think that I'm a wonderful person because look at all that I've done. It's about Christ. It always has been. It always will be. The life of the follower of Jesus is rooted in Christ. Right? Just like he says in the, the book of John, the gospel, John 15. He is the vine, we are the branches. If anyone remains in Christ, he will bear much fruit. Why? Because the fruit comes from him, not from us. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our holiness. And so, for those of us who are here this morning that are in Christ, we run the gamut. Some of us are walking with Christ. Some of us are just trying to keep step. Some of us are kind of like the illustration with our spouse. We wake up in the morning and we're like, okay, time to get my stuff done, but oh yeah, I should probably spend some time with God. Um, okay, God loves me. Okay. I, okay, I should love God back. Uh, okay, we won't think about that too much. Um, what should I... Um, I, I should not sin. Okay, I'm going to have to reorder my whole day. Uh, <laughs> how are we walking with Christ? You know, it's often been said that people don't come to the church. They, they don't want to come to Christ because, man, I look at the church and it's full of hypocrites. You know, people who who say one thing with their lips and yet they do something else with their actions. Well, is that really true? I used to say that, well, we're all kind of hypocrites because we all fail to live up to a standard. But that's not really true, is it? Because some of us don't really have a standard. We just kind of go through life day to day, and we don't have anyone that we're answering to. We don't have a standard to rely on. We just kind of do life as it seems right to us at the time, in the moment. And so if we are truly in Christ, we're not hypocrites because we can't live up to the standard. We wouldn't be hypocrites by saying, this is my standard, and I failed to meet it all the time. Thanks be to Christ. We are hypocrites if we claim some standard, and yet the standard really isn't in our life. We claim Christ in name only, but we don't claim Christ in our walk in our walk, in the way that we live. I think it's possible that there are many people in the American church, even in the worldly church, the world over church, who are in danger of what John is talking about here. 
people who claim to love Christ, people who claim to be rooted in Christ, and yet they're not really. Maybe their assurance came from the fact that they got dunked at some point in time in their life, or they said a prayer, and they thought, wow, I'm done. This is great. Maybe they came to Christ because someone said, well, you know what? Even if you don't know, if you're not sure about these things, it'd be good to have the fire insurance. But is that trust in Christ? Is that relying on Christ? Is that coming to Christ in repentance? Is it coming to Christ in full knowledge of what your sins do? in the sight of a holy God. And so as we close this morning, I pray that all of us would do some serious heart looking about how we came to Christ. Did we come to Christ because someone told us, well, it's probably a good thing to do, you know, just to be safe. Or did we come to Christ because someone had the strength to tell us that our sinfulness before the holy God of all creation is offensive and it makes us an enemy of God. If you are in your sins, if you are not in Christ this morning, then right now as it stands, you are an enemy to God and God is a righteous judge and he will judge sin finally, one day, and it will be pushed back in the light of the God who is light. That sin will be pushed back. This morning, are you going to be carried away by that? Or are you resting? Are you trusting that man, despite my sin, despite how offensive my sin is to the holy God of all creation, despite this, because of the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf, because he took off his robe of righteousness and put it on me, and he took off my robe of sinfulness and condemnation and put it on himself and died for the likes of me. Because he did that, because he rose again from the grave on the third day, because he conquered death and sin in one fell swoop, I don't have to fear the punishment of my sin. If you're in that place where you have never heard this message before like that, now is the day of your salvation. You're not granted the next day, the next couple of hours. You're not granted the next moment. Remember what I said earlier? I just want to say it again because this is great. What if I was up here in myocardial infarction right here? I just died. What if I did a face plant? Bam! right onto the communion table, sent those things flying. I was dead to rights. What a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> I, would, I would love it, right? Because scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When this life ends, I know that because of Christ, I will be standing in the presence of my Lord and Savior. And for the first time, I will see him face to face. Man, what an awesome time. Please, if you're here this morning, I implore you. I do not want you to go to hell. That is why I am saying these things up here. I am pleading with you. Be reconciled to God. Christ is the only way to be reconciled to God. He is the only one who lived a perfect life. And since you probably haven't lived a perfect life, you need Christ. 
not just for your salvation, but for the life of holiness and righteousness that he calls us to live, not on our own, but in him. As the worship team comes forward to lead us in worship, I pray that you'll stand with us. And we're gonna sing a song of invitation. And as we sing, man, if you are in Christ, praise him for what he's done for you. Praise God for what he's done for you. And if you are not in Christ this morning, trust that you cannot choose the hour of your death. And do work in your heart right now. Come face to face with the Lord whom for, uh, with whom we have to do. Come to him.